Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat uh, for August 1st, 2012. Uh, I'm Matt Gradwell from UppercutWoodworks.com. You can find me on uh, Twitter at uh, UppercutWood. Here with me is... Chris Wong. You can find me. My website is FlareWoodworks.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at FlareWoodworks. Tonight our special guest is Shannon Rogers. Hello. <laughs> I'm here. Um, Shannon Rogers. You can find me at Renaissance WW on Twitter, the RenaissanceWoodworker.com, and a whole bunch of other places all over the interwebs and the Facebooks and things like that. And the Google Plus. The pluses of the Googles. <laughs> the pluses of the Googles. <laughs> and floating somewhere in the bottom of this fat tire bottle. Nice. Oh, that, that's nice. Yeah. Again, probably one of the other reasons why I'm not broadcasting from the shop tonight because I wanted a beer. <laughs> okay, good call. Yeah. So what's um, happening, guys? Well, we have a couple of announcements first. Um, just a reminder that the Modern Workers Association is not um, doing a live broadcast tonight. Um, I think they're doing one either tomorrow or next week. And that um, next they week have, or the week they have a meetup though this weekend though, don't they? What's that? They have a meetup this weekend though, don't they? Because they find it working a lot. I think there's a meetup. Let me just check yeah. real quick. Um, Find Woodworking Live, uh, the their version of Woodworking in America, if it's oh, okay to say right. that. That is in New Paltz this weekend, isn't it? Yeah, so I know mm. they're uh, meeting at some Roman god restaurant, Bacchus or something like that. That's yes, right, yep. Bacchus, yeah. that's right. Diami said he was going to close down the bar, so we'll see. <laughs> I don't think he did yeah. last year at Woodworking in America, so I can't see that happening this year. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, challenge challenges out there. I well, I'm throwing down the gauntlet yeah. for him. Yeah. <laughs> um, last week they had Ron Hawk on. That was that was pretty fantastic. Ron Hawk. Mm -hmm. I met Ron Hawk at the Lee Nielsen Tool Tool Show um, in Portland in the spring, and he's just he's a he's a fantastic guy. So Ooh, yeah. Um, so um, another announcement. Uh, in a week or two, we'll be having Steve Ramsey from Mere Mortals Woodworking or Woodworking for Mere Mortals. Why can't I say woodworking? Woodworking for Mere Mortals. Uh, Steve Ramsey will be on with us. He is one of my favorite um, online wood online woodworkers. God, I just can't say woodworking. <laughs> Unique New York. The Human Torch was denied a bank loan. Yes. Bush League, Audrey. Bush League. That's right. That is Bush League. And then a quick reminder, for those of you who are watching but would like to tweet along, uh, you can do that by following the hashtag WoodChat or by going to uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom, and that has the video and the um, uh, tweet along right there. For those of you who are tweeting but would like to watch, you can do the same thing, or you can also watch on YouTube in the Uppercut Woodworks channel. Um, again, we record this live. We pull a transcript of all the Twitter traffic and get that pulled into the video. So if you ever watch the Twitter video, uh, you ever watch the YouTube video in the future, you click the red closed captioning button and you can watch all the tweet traffic. Um, and we also do text transcripts um, on the website. So very cool and somewhat distracting. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, but that was a custom application I had to write. So everybody, no, but just the closed captioning. I think that's pretty cool. I, yeah, I had I no idea you could do that. captioning stream. So. Yeah. Can you tweet the arsonist has oddly shaped feet? Is that a hundred yeah, characters? I did not characters do that one. I did not. <laughs> um, I, I how many characters that a, is. Um, I was a talking head in a game where they were going to do voiceover, and so they just had me say watermelon zero. And they said they could basically put any um, voiceover to me saying watermelon zero. So if you play Mech, War Mech Commander 2 as the character Animal Mother you'll see me going like this in a fake robot cockpit saying Watermelon Zero. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. Audio geeks, speech, speech majors would love that stuff. So. I could say I knew you then. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Anyway, uh, enough with stupid announcements. Um, I've got one, Matt. Yeah, you do. Um, as you know, um, I also am a partner in Time Warp Toolworks, mm -hmm, and it right. was July 29th of last year that we had our first meeting with uh, Mr. Shannon Rogers about hey. the feasibility of this weird idea of making molding planes. And gee, it's, 
it's taken off. That's so awesome. That was a year and two days ago, Shannon. Yeah, I don't. I'll drink to that. I don't have much memory <laughs> memory of that because I was like like chicken with my head cut off trying to prepare for woodworking in America and having a booth That's right in the marketplace. That was like a here's to you guys. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I can't tell you. Let's see. How many profiles have I cut with those planes in the last year? I don't know. Too many to count. That's great. Congratulations, that's guys. That's that's very cool. Congratulations, Chris. What's, what's okay. the next 12 months for Time Warp 2 Works hold for us? Uh, a lot. Um, <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you got a stomach parasite. Well, I'm unplugging my headphones here. Um, what do we got going? Well, we've got WAA. We're going to... Um, not going to be a vendor this time. Um, what we've got some new planes that we've been talking about, and cool. Shannon, you've been feeding us ideas for that. And um, <laughs> we're, we're, um, hey, Chris, why don't you make this? Yeah, yeah. I need uh, one of these. Why don't you yeah, make those? Yeah, that, that's that's been how it's been, and we've got lots of uh, suggestions from other woodworkers as well. Um, lots of prototyping going on. And at the same time, we're trying to keep building molding planes to get some in stock, which has been surprisingly difficult. So, yeah, yeah, lots of new stuff coming on the pipe, and we're hoping to get some of that stuff out for in time for the new year. Any idea what your lead time's like these days for molding planes? It depends yeah. when you depends when you order them. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> um, I think we're looking at a few weeks right right now. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, happy comment from to Brian you and, and Garth. Thank you. And Garth's in the chat room today. Um, nice to see him hang out here on Twitter. He's not out on Twitter very often. Hey, Garth. Um, comment from Brian in, on, in the chat room on WoodChat um, asking about shoulder planes. And we've got rabbit planes. No shoulder planes at the moment, though. I think with their they're covered fairly well, so. And there Maybe is a difference. The there is a difference, there Prime, is. between shoulder planes and rabbit planes. Don't mix them up under penalty of death. Uh, okay. Would you, would you care to explain that, <laughs> Shannon? Well, a shoulder plane traditionally is a low angle plane, a bevel up plane, if you will. Um, it does not have a side escapement or even a conical escapement. So when you take a shaving, it just curls up inside the body. So it's not really made for doing long runs like you would in a molding. You know, if you're sticking a molding, you've got a six, eight, ten foot board that you're running a rabbit all the way along. That shaving is going to curl up inside really tightly, and it's going to clog. Plus, just the geometry is off. You know, the low angle plane, it's it's not going to you know it's not going to work as well. It's not going to cut as well um, as as you would expect um, a higher angle higher angle mm -hmm. rabbit plane. Um, the rabbit plane has a side escapement, meaning the chip comes out the side, um, so that as you make that long stick, it peels off the side and falls onto the floor or onto the bench. Um, it sounds like a really minor issue, but it's a royal pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if you're cutting rabbits, say a, an OG, you've got to cut, um, what, two rabbits and a chamfer. You're running yeah. along an eight-foot length you know, and you're constantly after every pass having to unclog that shaving. It's it's yeah. a pain in the butt. Yeah, you know how you stick your finger through the side of your shoulder plane. With the rabbit plane, that's a non-issue. You don't have to do that at all. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then on the other hand, uh, the low angle of the shoulder plane makes it suited for trimming the shoulders of a tenon, where you can we have to work with the end grain. Yeah. So two different tools. They look close, but they're not. Very true. And don't mix them up, or Shannon will hunt you down and kill you. <laughs> Under penalty of death. <laughs> I it was an F from the professor at the hand tools. <laughs> I will hurl heavy shoulder planes at you with great yes. speed. Um, okay, so really quick, guys, what's on your what's on your bench? Chris, you want to start? Sure. Um, right now, I'm still building a loft bed with a slide on it. Um, I think that the finish for this maple trestle table is about cured, so I can rub it out. Um, those two are taking up my entire shop, and then I'm also doing a flooring job. Um, I'm flooring the stairs in my house at the same time, so 
as if I don't need more projects in my shop. Uh, I got another one there. Um, one exciting project that's just gotten underway. We've, we've been talking about this for about two years. Um, there's someone who's been at, who's asked me to help him set up a shop. So cool. he's about a half an hour away. So we've been blocking off days where I can go out there and together we can spend the day. Uh, yesterday was a shopping day. Went out there, bought some stuff, and started setting up tools. And then now we get to work on a floor plan, put together a bench, lay out his shop the way we want it, put up some lumber racks, and then after that we'll start building some stuff. And that's going to be fun and doesn't take up any of my shop space. <laughs> and none of There's... your shop money either. Hey, mm -hmm. that's awesome. License to shop yeah. and not have to clean up afterwards. That's right. How, how much money did you guys spend yesterday? Uh, uh, a lot of it was planning. We didn't actually spend a whole lot. Um, I sent him out today to buy stuff. Um, I don't think we spent anything yesterday. Well, he's been running. Shopping? Yeah, we went shopping trying to figure out stuff. Um, he, he oh, you were looking at stuff. Yeah. He gave Where's me a call shop? today and said, Chris, you sent me on. I'm running around like a woman shopping. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's got a good sense of humor. It's fun to work with. Cool. Yeah, see, sounds like fun. I usually don't go shopping. I usually go buying. Yes. <laughs> I know yeah. exactly what yeah. I want, so I go, go and get it. Um, all right, so Shannon, you were telling us before we actually started the live broadcast what you had been working on. Why don't you get everybody up to speed and... Well, uh, right now, I am working on nothing, which is fabulous. <laughs> it's <laughs> exciting. Um, this Monday, I published the last video of Spencer 3 of my hand tool school. So, um, and I, I didn't, it's one of those things where you have this great idea to, to launch this business and, and kind of jump into this idea. And you don't think 12, 18 months down the road. And I basically did not plan a break. In, in the first three semesters of this thing. So the last 18 months, actually a little more than 18 months, I have been just nonstop producing, you know, well over 150 hours of video content and building and building and building and building. Um, the last six months I built a joint air bench, I built a wall clock, and I just finished up a colonial corner cabinet along with, you know, a bunch of miscellaneous shop projects and filming every bit of it and doing videos and all that fun stuff. So uh, finishing that on Monday, uh, yesterday, uh, Tuesday, all I did was come home, sit on the couch, and watch the Olympics. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was very cool. Um, but as I was telling you guys beforehand, it's like my mind is just spinning. You know, I'm not in the shop right now, but all I can think about is what I'm going to tackle next. And I've got about, uh, about seven weeks before I launch into semester four. Uh, and uh, I've got a bunch of things I want to wrap up, um, build, and finish in that time period. I've got a bunch of other projects that are kind of midway through. Uh, I have a spring pole lathe that's almost completely built down in the shop. I just need a spring pole, go figure. Um, and I have some hickory sent to me from a buddy who I need to uh, shape that into a pole because it's a five-quarter five quarter by three, I think, piece. So it needs to be shaped into about a one-inch dowel. Um, just brought home some Alaskan yellow cedar today to make a uh, tool tote, uh, the same one that Roy Underhill carries around at the beginning of the Woodwright shop, because um, I have taken over the shop master position at the museum where I volunteer, and yes. uh, there's quite a few projects kind of on the horizon, some restoration type stuff, so um, while we have a lot of tools at the museum, uh, not all of them are really sharp, and some of them are actually collector's items. Um, so I'm just going to bring some of my own tools from home. And, uh, you know, I thought, how cool would that be? You know, make a Roy Underhill tool tote and go hang out in a 19th century uh, living history museum with it. So, yeah, I'm cool. kind of gone off the deep end a little bit on that. But um, I'm looking forward to that because it will just be real simple. You know, I mean, if you can call compound angles simple, but, you know, just yeah. rabbits and, and uh, I've got some rot cut nails that I think will be kind of cool into the rabbits. Look cool. kind of neat. So looking forward to that. Just going to build it out of one board. And uh, Are you going to dress up in the period fashion as well? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of debate about that at the museum right now. Um, uh -huh. I remember the first day I volunteered, I showed up dressed like Roy Underhill. Because <laughs> in the Victorian period that we really embrace, 
that was kind of it, you know. I mean, suspenders and denim, that was kind of what you wore. So I dressed up that way. I even had a little hat, like the Underhill hat. And I showed up, and the guy, the, the, the previous shop masters, he's got a T-shirt on, shorts, and tennis shoes. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? And that's why you don't have a job anymore, Shannon. <laughs> It's like I showed up to the prom in the same dress as the prom queen. It was terrible. <laughs> so, but the new director of the museum comes from um, comes from a living history background. So she's real big. She'll disappear into the woods for like two weeks on end for like um, you know Renaissance festival type reenactments. She's very serious about it, and she really wants to turn it into a living history museum instead of kind of a curation uh, museum where you just have exhibits that you look at. She wants it to look like, you know, the joiner stepped away from his bench minutes ago and everything is just ready to be picked up and go back to work. And so I think we're probably heading that way, but I think it's going to take a while because we have a lot of volunteers who've been volunteering there for 25 years and you try to tell them to they're going to have to dress up when it's 98 degrees with 98% yeah. humidity on a Saturday. Yeah, not so much. So we'll we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I, um, I went to the wood shop at Boeing, their original wood shop where they made their very first airplanes, their very first propellers, all out of wood. Beautiful building, big timbers, big workbenches, lots of old tools. Super excited because I didn't know it was there when I went to the um, Museum of Flight in Seattle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> went into the shop and. I saw a tool tote full of planes and tools and things, but they're all they're all positioned to look like the joiner just stepped away, but they're all like screwed down or screwed to the yeah. Going, yeah. Why? Why is yeah. this guy here doing actual work, showing people how these things? Yeah. And it was empty. There's no nobody to talk to, <laughs> and they have literally like wax mannequins like <laughs> at the tools. And it, oh, yeah. it's such a lost opportunity. Such a lost yeah. opportunity. So Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Pretty frustrating. But, you know, it takes a lot of work. It takes, I mean, we, we have very few volunteers, which if I may throw an announcement out, I'm looking for volunteers, um, looking for folks who want to hang out in a period shop. Um, you know, we're only open, what, May to October every year, and and, at, and that we're only open Saturdays and Sundays from 12 to 4 or 1 to 4, depending on if we have an event. So, I mean, we're looking for people who can commit to three hours, three to four hours, one day, a weekend, maybe once every other month or something like that. I'm trying to get, like, four or five guys that can work in the shop um, just because right now there's two of us, and the two of us mm. have to cover Saturday and Sunday right. um, all during the open season. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of work to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, unless you've got a, a, a an army of volunteers – you end up with a wax figure and, and planes screwed down to the bench. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's unfortunate. How, how's the traffic through the museum? You know, it depends on how hot it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's uh, last Saturday we had, last Saturday was 96 degrees and about 99% humidity. <laughs> and um, we had three families come through in four hours. And, you know, each of them hung out for a long time and had a great time, but that was it. It was very quiet. Week before that, it was nonstop. You know, we probably yeah. had 100, 200 people come through in that period of time. And, you know, they, they flock to the wood shop. We have a blacksmith mm -hmm. shop, and um, we only have one blacksmith, so it's very rare that there's someone actually working in the blacksmith shop. But we at least open it so people can walk through. Uh, we have a... a a weavery where there's a bunch of there's a loom and some spinning wheels and things like that. And we do have a pretty accomplished weaver, but um, you know, let's be honest, it's tools. You know, they they nothing wrong with knitting. They, they stop by the weavery and like, oh, that's kind of neat. Ooh, what's that over there? Ooh, saw. Ooh, drill. And they come across. <laughs> they walk across the little grassy knoll there and they hang out in the wood shop. So mm -hmm. we're we're definitely a big draw. But I think the other thing, and, and to your point, Matt, um, we're in there working. You know, I mean, yeah. people walk by and they hear pounding and they hear sawing and it just draws people in. Chris, you remember yeah. at Woodworking in America last year. We're standing yeah. around in the booth and suddenly one of us picks up a tool and it's like a yes. magnet. You know, yeah. 300 people just cram around you. And you're yeah. standing there, you haven't even done anything yet. You're just holding a yeah. plane. <laughs> people, yeah. like, come right up. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's a missed opportunity if you're not actually working. Um, mm -hmm. 
that and the fact that it's a good opportunity. I, I, it's very difficult to get ex anything actually done because you know people have questions and they want to yeah. see a tool. And what's cool is we let people actually pick up the tools. Well, to some extent, you know, we're not letting the little kids walk around with razor sharp chisels and things. But you know, I've actually shown a kid how to use a draw knife before and had him sit down at a nice. you know this little teeny five year old kid had him sit on a at a shaving horse and you kind of reach around him and hold his arms and show him how to use the draw knife. And, you know, their face yeah. just lights up. And, of course, the parents, yeah. cameras are out and snapping pictures. And, you know, yeah. um, so last weekend, all I managed to make was six pegs. <laughs> six pegs. Six pegs. Six pegs. <laughs> they had four hours to make six three-eighths inch yeah. pegs to draw bore a door. <laughs> so, Must have been a cool weekend. <laughs> yep. It was. It was. <laughs> it was cloudy and about 80 degrees, and there were a lot yeah. of people there, so... Yeah, but you know we have we have huge events like we have a renaissance or not a renaissance, a medieval fair. We have a blues festival. Uh, we have a mm. Celtic festival with like caber toss and and um, the medieval fair has like ring jousting and everything. So we get some pretty huge turnouts on those on those particular days. So how long does it take for you to make that caber? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I well. <laughs> I'll start on it now, and it should be ready by next May when the. It's a big, it's a big shaving out. horse. Yeah, damn right. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. Yeah. You were mentioning earlier that now that you're kind of taking a break after finalizing some uh, lessons for the hand tool school, that you're kind of making a mental list of a bunch of little little projects that you want to do in the shop. Yeah. What are yeah. those? Well, um, there's method to my madness. First of all, the Renaissance Woodworker is still a love that site. I love putting out, you know, that podcast. Um, it's been tough since I launched a premium site. I mean, obviously, when people pay me for content, that has to be the priority. So, you know, the number of Renaissance Woodworker episodes has kind of taken a nosedive in the last year. Um, I think I averaged it out, and I'm still averaging about one episode every two weeks, <laughs> but there happens to be like four-week hiatus here and there, and then there's a bunch of episodes. So I want to make a bunch of stuff to be published there. The Spring Pole Lathe is one of them. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be a multi-part series coming out there. Um, I want to do several very small, short projects, kind of showing people that you don't have to have 20 different hand planes and every chisel mm -hmm. under the sun. So I'm thinking of something called Three Tools with Three Tools. Um, three videos where I make a shop tool using only three tools. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, it's been done a bunch of times, but why not a, a tri-square, um, just using a saw and a chisel, frankly. Um, make a, mar a marking gauge, just using a chisel and a saw. And, uh, you know, I haven't figured out what the third tool will be, probably a pair of dividers. Um, yeah. And then I probably will turn that Roy Underhill toolbox into uh, something real simple, because you can make that with a saw and a chisel. That's all it's going to take, really. Yeah. So yeah. I want to do a couple of those type of things, real, real simple projects that illustrate not only very few tools in use, but just fundamental hand tool schools, or hand tool schools, mm -hmm. hand tool skills, skills. Wo woodworking, woodworking <laughs> hand tool skills. <laughs> so woodworking. I, <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I think, and I've fallen into this trap where you get these cool specialty planes, you know, I mean, they're, they're such a... a, a bounty, if you will, of, of hand tool makers now, that it's it's easy to get a rabbit plane. It's easy to get a philister plane. It's it's expensive, but it's easy. You know, click a button and enter your credit card number. That's pretty easy. But I think what happened is, you know, people forgot how to make a rabbit without a rabbit plane. You know, granted, a rabbit plane is the best way to do it, but knowing how to do it with a chisel, I think, will open up so many different doors. So it's kind of what I want to do. Um, there's a couple other things. Matt, you'll be interested in this one. I actually have this one filmed already. I just need to edit it. I make a vice handle. Oh. Um, hey. <laughs> I and then I, then I put it in a box and ship it off to Matt Gradwall. So, you shipped um, it? <laughs> no, I haven't shipped it yet. I have to make the, the other little end. I oh, filmed gotcha. making the little circular knob on one end. Yeah. Um, now I need to make the other one, and then I'll put it in a box and ship it to you. But I'll probably okay. do that this so weekend. There are two handles, right? There are two handles. Yeah. Oh. Oh, so that's, that's true. I have, I have to make. God I have to make three knobs. Offspring and everybody in your family. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
I don't so, want to tell. I don't want to tell people when you originally asked me to do that. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. I'm not going to burn that bridge. I'm just so. I'm just so happy. So, um, you know, there's there's a bunch of. Oh, now I can't think of anything else. Um, there's there's just little like everything from shop projects to like when I get the spindle or the spindle when the spring pole lathe gets finished, I want to do yeah. some more turning, but I want to do it on the spring pole lathe, um, yeah. which ought to be real interesting because I have about. 30 minutes of spring pole time under my belt. So that ought to be kind of a um, trial by fire. But, you know, if nothing else, <laughs> here's what it takes to adjust from a power lathe to a spring pole lathe. That ought to yeah. be fun. But, Are you going uh, to sell your power lathe? Probably not. Um, just because I still, every Christmas, end up making, like, 50 pens. Yeah, and, you're going to, you're uh, going to production uh, mode at Christmas. Yeah. You know, yeah, and shakers and, and pens and... Um, Right. Well, first of all, I couldn't put a mandrel on a spring pole lathe because the spring pole is just, just two dead centers that the piece rotates on because the, the rope that attaches to the spring pole wraps around the piece and it causes it to spin between those dead centers. So mm -hmm. you can't use a mandrel. You can't turn a pin. Um, now, I, I am going to be building a treadle lathe. That's a hand tool school project for semester um. five. So that's one of the other reasons the spring pole lathe is coming up because I want to compare and contrast the two. Once I get the treadle lathe up and running, I am going to modernize that, and I'm going to use a modern spindle. Just I'm going to buy the spare part from probably Jet, uh, maybe Grizzly, depending on where I can get it cheaper, um, and integrate that modern spindle with the Morse taper insert and the threaded, uh, the threaded outsert. <laughs> I don't know what you call that. The part that allows you to screw the chuck on, but then there's also the hollow Morse taper that you can put a drive center in or whatever. So I'm going to integrate that into um, essentially an, 18, um, an 1800s treadle lathe. So technically I could turn pens there, but, you know, I mean, that's what the mini lathe is for, truthfully. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got all the, all the stuff for it, and it takes up, like, no space in the shop. So I probably will end up kind of putting it away in a cabinet once the treadle is up and running. Um, yeah. But, you know, the same reason I haven't got rid of my bandsaw and my planer, because mm -hmm. there are times when you just got to crank stuff out, you know. It's not <laughs> it's not fun to hand plane 104 feet. So what's, yeah. what's next for the... Do you the, miss your um, table saw at all? No, not at all. Did I have a table saw? I don't remember. <laughs> That's what you, you know, stack while you would. Pretty much, yeah. You know, I... My first real test, and granted, I don't do projects that would require a lot of table saw work. I'm not building large cabinets or anything. Um, and frankly, that's one of the reasons I bought a Festal track saw, because um, I do have ah, some okay. built-in bookshelves in my future in our master bedroom, and those will be made out of plywood. Um, but, you know, once I got rid of the table saw, I thought anything where I would need that kind of straight-line rip capacity with, you know, Frankly, with plywood, just because planing plywood is not very much fun. Hand planing plywood is not very much fun. Planing plywood in general is not very much fun. Um, uh, plywood is not very much fun. Yes. yes. <laughs> Depends on who you're buying your plywood from. I can help yeah. you with that. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, the, the track saw will be able to do everything. And what's funny is that I have a huge run of built-in bookshelves in the lower level of my house. That was like one of the first projects I built when I moved into my house, and I did it with a Craftsman circular saw and a router. You know, so um, it's so funny how quickly you forget once you have things like a table saw and a router table and a band saw. How quickly you forget, you know, you don't need all that. So the best thing I could have ever done to get over the need for a table saw was to get rid of it. And you just you realize how very quickly how little you actually need it. Um, mm -hmm. I even rarely rip on the bandsaw now, honestly. Um, wow. But I'm weird that way, too. Very weird. <laughs> I like my hand saws. Yeah. I, I need my table saw, though. I'm not going to get rid of that one. To each his own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, I'm, I think I'm going to probably increase my um, power tools this year. I, over the last couple of years, the, the biggest thing I wanted to incorporate into my work was more curves. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. now I want to now I I don't turn, and uh, I don't know if I would turn a lot, but I think every once in a while there is a need for something turned, 
yeah. maybe vice handles or legs or whatever, and um, getting into that. Even if it's just a skill I want to, uh, to to build, even if I don't use it a lot, I just still want to be able to build that skill. Yeah. So I'll, pro I'll probably be looking into a lathe um, come around Christmas time. Sure. So. Well, and then you'll end up using it at Christmas time every year too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but you know, I the think... Lathe, those, you're going you're to have really nice calves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I used to be a cyclist, so hopefully they'll come back. Vanderlis uh, was too. Vanderlis was too. Yeah, I was a road guy. He was a, he was a dirty mountain biker. Dirty mountain biker, right? I did so, my share of mountain biking. Uh, now, one I want to offend the mountain bikers. Uh, go ahead. One of the things we talked with Mark and Matt about was Wood Talk Online Radio hitting its hundredth uh, episode. So congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think yes. everybody in Wood Chat is basically a, a fan of of Wood Talk Online and the five year history of that, which is you know. If you look at 100 shows over five or six years, that's that's a show a month. That's pretty good. Yeah, I did the math because we were thinking, wow, it took us forever to get there. But when you actually do the math, it's pretty impressive. You know? It is. It is. It's oh. very impressive. And, and you think and, back to 2007, I mean. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's impressive, and I wasn't part of it the whole time, so I really shouldn't talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I came. I showed up around 60-something, I think. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's all. That's all. Mark and Matt up till then. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we asked those guys was how their woodworking has, has evolved. I know that obviously you're you're very much a hand tool guy. You mentioned building the built-ins with a Craftsman circular saw and a router. So um, I think everybody knows what kind of woodworker you are now. <laughs> but I haven't heard the story about how you got into woodworking and what your start was like and what tools you used and things you built and. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a cool story. It's a, it's a heartwarming story. Um, it's kind of a hallmark moment. It, uh, let's see. It's been more than 10 years now. Um, let's see. What year is it? Let's see that. Let's see. It's about 12 years, uh, almost 12 years. Um, we, when my wife and I were buying our very first single-family home, um, right when we closed on it, her grandfather uh, was admitted to hospice. Uh, he had cancer, and um, and you know it was one of those things where it could be tonight, could be a week from now. So basically, every day after work, we went to the hospital. You know, we closed on our house, but had not opened the front door, had not darkened the doorstep. Um, it was just it wasn't important. So we went to the hospital, and frankly, sat around and watched Baltimore Orioles games, and just hung out with a guy. He was a carpenter. Um, he built most of the really high-end homes in kind of old Baltimore in the 50s. So um, he would just put on the Orioles game, huge Orioles fan, and just pepper me with questions. What are you going to do? What, you know, what are the improvements you're going to make? Um, and my mother-in-law jokes that he wanted to make sure I was going to take care of his granddaughter, basically. Um, and, and I got so many ideas, and he gave me so many tips and pointers and things to, you know, this is all typical homeowner DIY type stuff. And, uh, you know, Heather and I had this kind of notebook running of projects we were going to build and things we were going to do from retail of bathroom to putting in hardwood flooring to all this stuff. And um, when uh, her grandfather eventually passed away, he ended up leaving me all his tools. Oh, wow. Well, I went from, like, you know, the, the apartment dweller's toolbox, you know, that little thing you buy at Lowe's that has, like, three screwdrivers and... And, you know, it's got the little plastic case with a clear front on it. You know, it's, I had that and a circular saw to having, like, six routers, um, a scroll saw, uh, good Lord, a bunch of hand planes, uh, a benchtop table saw, a benchtop joiner, a uh, bunch of other stuff, you know. For the most part, um, like, the on-site contractor's toolkit. You know, it was all meant to be very mobile. There were no big stationary tools or anything like that. So, like, none of his routers were fitted to put in a table or anything like that. But, you know, a whole boatload of router bits and everything. So I went into, I just kind of walked into a pretty well-outfitted shop. Wow. You know, for somebody that's just doing DIY work, uh, it was perfect. You know, overkill, in fact. And um, I didn't even know what a router was. You know, I was like, what the heck is a router? And if you think 12 years ago, you know, wireless routers weren't on the scene, so I didn't know what a, 
IT router was either. Uh, I was like, what the heck is a router? Um, and in fact, I, I still, uh, well, I have, I still have all of the tools that, that he left me just for sentimental reasons. But, you know, it was so funny because I, I started building little things here and there and kind of took to it like a duck to water. And, you know, I didn't have shop in high school. We didn't have any of that. You know, plus I was a music major, so I would have been in the in choir anyway. I probably wouldn't have taken shop even if I, we had it. Um, but, man, if we had shop when I was in high school, who knows where I'd be now? You know, because it, like, it was like coming home. It was the perfect thing for me to do. Um, and uh, I just took off, you know, and I started digging around, finding any bit of information I could. David Marks was on DIY at the time. Um, so of course I that opened my eyes because it was like you know everybody had seen Norm, but David Marks was like a whole different level, and it was like wow you know I didn't know you could even do some of that stuff. So I just kind of uh, took off from there and just began examining everything, um, building anything and everything I could. Mostly was you know pieces that my wife needed around the house, a lot of cabinet type work. Um, I built a. Uh, pretty large cabinet actually to house my treadmill. I have one of those fold up deck treadmills. And um, you know, treadmill's ugly. <laughs> Unless you have a set room in your house that's a gym, it's just it's ugly. It's an eyesore in any other house. So I built this big cabinet that you open these two doors and the deck just folds up and you close the doors and the treadmill's hidden away. Um, that was all built out of MDF ply basically. Um, uh, um, and it came out great, you know. Um, I then built a smaller cabinet from there in the, pretty much the same style because it's in the same room, and it holds um, all of my wife's wrapping stuff. <laughs> she has more wrapping paper than, I think, Santa Claus. Oh, and, I thought uh, you meant like her big gold necklace. No, that too. microphone and her turntable. <laughs> yeah. DJ Heather on the, on the scene. <laughs> yeah, she's the, she's the coolest music teacher you'll ever meet for that reason alone. Yeah, she's got all her grills on a little custom-made uh, drawer there. She pulls nice. it out. She's got a diamond grill and a gold one. It's awesome. No, nothing quite that glamorous. My wife worked at Hallmark for probably 20 years before we met, <laughs> so has more wrapping paper. Uh -huh. And yeah, she's a, bless her heart. She loves to give presents to people, so she has lots of wrapping paper. So she needed her own cabinet, you know. Um, you know, I did the typical stuff. I, when I got into the, quote, fine woodworking side of things, I built cutting boards. I built boxes galore, more boxes than you can shake a stick at. Um, and, and it's funny because, you know, the original ones I gave to my wife, and it was usually like there was some other present inside of it, like tickets to a show or something inside this handcrafted box. And so they're still floating around the house, and, man, they're ugly. <laughs> man. <laughs> You know, when, when, when you make, like, finger joints, and this is, like, before you know anything about wood, and you cut them cross-grain, and you don't understand why the little fingers fell mm -hmm. off. You know, we're talking yeah. the fingers go this way, but the yeah. grain runs this way. Yeah. So you've got all this short yeah. grain out here. And you go to assemble yeah. it, and you pound it together, and all the fingers pop off. You're like, what? Yeah. I've got some bad wood, man. i got to go get some more wood. Yeah. You're buying, your, you're buying all your wood at Home Depot. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then I discovered this store called Woodcraft, and that was the beginning of the end right there. Cause, you know, Woodcraft still to this day sells those, like, um, RDS 4S little pieces, like craft packs, in any yeah. species under the sun. So another one of my disaster boxes, the joinery is good, nice and tight, but I made it out of, like, seven different woods. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> god-awful, clashing, ugly thing. You know, when you first start, you clown, discover... Clown pants of boxes. Oh, totally. There's some yellow heart. There's purple heart. There's some zebra wood. You know, it's like all this god-awful, heavily uh, gaudy colored thing. It's just a terrible box. What's funny is it sits in my shop now, and it holds rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> so what, yeah. what was your day job at the time? Because now your day job is actually in the, in the fine lumber industry, but what was your yeah. day job back then? Um, I found guys like you, Matt. <laughs> and I put them to work. I was an IT recruiter. And, oh, okay. Uh, then moved into project management, IT project management. And, um, you know, it was great. Learned a lot. Learned a lot about business. But, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, when, when that staffing market started to fall apart and things, uh, I made a, just made a change. You know, I, I felt I was being pigeonholed in one direction, and I didn't want to do that anymore. So uh, mm -hmm. I went into Internet marketing, and, frankly, the Renaissance Woodworker helped me get that job because uh, just my understanding of social media and, 
you know, blogging and content marketing and things like that. So I landed a job with an internet marketing firm, and you know, that turned into director of marketing at you know a lumber company. So it's a it's a Cinderella story. What can I say? Yeah. So yeah. When, you, when you started woodworking, were you primarily using all those all those power tools? Um, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it was it was like a lot of us, you know. You didn't even know that people still used hand tools. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. yeah. And and frankly, when you looked at, um, you know, the outside influences, and this is really, I mean, this is prior to, prior to the Wood Whisperer, prior to Matt's Basement Workshop, you know. Um, this this online thing we have now didn't exist, or if it did, it was in a like a user net forum, you know, text based, yeah. um, mm-hmm. telnet type thing, and um, IRC chat or Compu yeah. chats or yeah, um, pretty much CompuServe. Ooh, Prodigy sends a chill down my spine. AOL but, um, and Prodigy, yeah, you know, dial up into some sort of uh, chat room type thing. And, um, you know, none of that was there. So when you watch, even if you watch David Marks now, um, the Woodworks, I mean, the Woodworks show, he doesn't use very many hand tools. You know, it's rare. I don't think I've ever seen him use a hand plane. You know, um, he cuts all his mortises with a router. Um, I think occasionally he squares them off with a chisel, but most of the time David Marks was using loose tenons. So there wasn't any, there was so little handwork. And, of course, Norm... You know, never used hand tools. Scott Phillips over the American Wood um, American Woodshop, is that what the show's called? Um, he uh, yeah. never used hand tools back then. And I didn't get the Woodwright Shop. I didn't I didn't see my first episode of the Woodwright Shop until I don't know, probably five years ago. Um, and to this day, we my local PBS still doesn't carry it. So um, there just was no exterior influence saying that anyone still use these hand tools. And I actually had a bunch of hand planes um, from from my grandfather-in-law. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a neat little, ooh, that's quaint. You know, I'll keep it in the bottom of the toolbox. Um, but, no, it was a trip to Colonial Williamsburg that did it for me. Um, I, I walked into the Anthony Hay cabinet shop, and I was like, holy crap. <laughs> Look at these guys, you know. And it was it was this quiet shop, and... You know, you hear the sound of a handsaw and the sound of a hand plane, and the furniture these guys were making was just incredible. So that same day, I walked into the Colonial Williamsburg gift shop, into their bookstore. They have a huge bookstore. And I immediately went into, like, the craft section. I was looking at, um, they have all these great books that are actually kind of hard to find elsewhere. Uh, Of course, every Roy Underhill book was there. And I bought, like, $200 worth of books, like, that afternoon. And... uh, and that was it, you know. From there, just my desire, my my kind of love of the real nerd in me came out. The the love of research and my love of history kind of took over. And uh, that, yeah, it was all over for me at that point. Ever since then, it's been fewer and fewer power tools. So what what would you call your first um, true hand tool project? Um, well... Let me back up just because it's cool <laughs> and tell you my first woodworking project ever um, was a proton pack <laughs> in eighth grade when I, I went as a race stands for Halloween. So I built my own proton pack out of scrap wood in my dad's wood shop. That was cool. Um, and I did use, I used a chisel to get the top off the glue bottle, I think. So I don't know if that counts. <laughs> that might count. Um, but no, my first hand tool, like hand tool only, like start to finish, no electrons whatsoever. Hmm. That was... Too bad. I wonder if I have a picture of it. I don't know that I have a picture of it. It's a, a, a small um, side table. Actually, somewhat similar to the, you know, that one drawer shaker table that so many people have built now. Uh, but there wasn't a drawer. Um, it had a lower shelf, and it was just a square, about 20-inch square table with uh, tapered legs. Um, pretty iconic shaker table. Uh, that was built. Uh, not an electron was harmed once during the building of that. And that was, I guess, uh, wasn't that long ago. I mean, that's what's crazy when I think it was probably four years ago. So, Yeah. I went off the deep end fast when I went into hand tools. Yeah. And how would you say that your hand tool 
um, skills have progressed since then, since, since diving in? Leaps and bounds. Huge, huge, huge progression. Um, you know, I, I had the, the know-how to do it, um, but, and especially, and it's funny because I, I've caught some flack for this publicly uh, about the name of my business, the Hand Tool School. Honestly, the school part was marketing. The fact that I call each group of lessons a semester, that's marketing, you know. I didn't want to call it the Hand Tool Guild because the Wood Whisperer Guild already existed and, you know, that would have been just a major, major fail for me to try to copy Mark. So I wanted to do something totally different, and I thought, you know, this idea of, you know, lumping lessons together, building lessons, and the whole school idea came out. But, you know, I'm not a 30-year woodworker, you know, that could be considered myself a master. So I've certainly caught a fair amount of flack for trying to, people thinking I'm putting myself out there as some sort of master woodworker, and that's, that's far from it, you know. Um, when, when I film a lesson in the hand tool school, I've done the stuff that I show before. It's not like it's the first time I've done it, you know. right. but I can't say that I've been doing it for, you know, 10 years. Um, four years is probably about right, but joining or starting the hand tool school was the impetus to kick those power tools out of my shop, to actually sell them and get rid of them, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you force yourself to work entirely by hand, and it's amazing how fast you pick it up, and it's amazing how much you improve that... Um, that kind of learning curve or, or you know, the, the, the graph of, of skill level to time is an exponential curve. You, you quickly get the hang of sawing and you develop kind of muscle memory and, and, you know, then you also get over the fact that it may not be perfectly square and plumb, but you know how to fix it with a hand plane and you can do it like that, you know, yeah. and, and then the next time you saw it, it's just that much more accurate. So the next time you plane it, it only takes two passes and it really doesn't take that much time. Um, I wrote a, a blog post about this a while back, just focused repetition really helps you because the problem with most of us amateur weekend warriors is, you know, we'll build one project over the course of six months and maybe you cut four tenons in that table um, or probably more likely eight tenons in the table. It's hard to build a table with four tenons. I suppose it's possible, but uh, a typical four-cornered table, there's going to be eight tenons there. Um, you cut those eight tenons once, you know, by hand in the course of that six-month build, you know, and, and you, you're just not going to pick it up with much. But if you cut ten tenons in a period of one shop session, um, it's amazing where you are at the end of that tenth tenon. Um, if you just unplug the planer and thickness four or five boards and get them perfectly parallel and perfectly flat, it's amazing yeah. how how easy it becomes. There's no secret to it. It's just do it, you know, and do it and screw up, frankly. Um, because it's all very tactile, because you're doing it by hand, after a while you really gain a feel for what is square, what is level. You, that, in, that inner level kind of comes out and just by touch you can feel well a board is out of flat. And there's no, you know, secret mojo to that. It's just doing it. It's, it's yeah. not yeah. having an excuse, not being able to fall back on screw this, I'm going to run it through the planer. And I still have a planer. And I still do that from time to time because you just get tired. <laughs> you know, you get worn out. I'm not as good a shape as I used to be. <laughs> I probably should be with all the hand tool work. That, that trail lathe is going to kick your butt, dude. Yeah, that's part of my weight loss plan. Weight yeah. loss through treadle. It's going to be the new, the latest <laughs> rage. It's going to sweep the nation, you watch. Yeah, the, uh, the wrestling coach used to say you have to get your reps in, and perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're cutting dovetails, you you have to take them all the way to fitting them. Yeah. The, the only thing I would I would take ex exception with that statement is the whole perfect practice thing. And I know what you mean, because I had the same thing drilled into my head by my swimming coach and my cycling coach and all those guys. But I think people are so afraid to screw things up that they just don't do it. You know, I'll yeah. learn to cut dovetails later. Or, well, one of these days I'll, I'll learn to flatten and straighten square and edge, you know. Um, it's, it's really not rocket science. Chuck Bender says it the best. Woodworkers are not smart guys, and if they can all do it, then it really can't be that hard, you know. Now, that's him speaking for himself. Me, personally, I'm incredibly smart, so, yeah. Exactly, yeah. 
<laughs> I, I agree, Shannon. You are smart, especially because you're sending me my vice handles. <laughs> Maybe it's smarter when they get here. <laughs> smart ass, more like, but yeah. <laughs> So um, there, there are. I'm just seeing what Chris is throwing up in the chat room, but should yeah, we address okay. some of these questions? <laughs> yes, we <Yep>. should. <laughs> okay, we're we're into the last nine minutes here. So if anyone has any questions for Shannon, you can drop them off on Twitter or hashtag WoodChat. Um, Chris, are you pulling everything in from Twitter? Because I specifically didn't fire up TweetDeck because it's too much of a distraction. Mostly. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's my job here. That's all. I'm good all right, for. cool. Um, all right. First question came from Brian. Um, Shannon, are you ambidextrous, or is that your sawing arm the size of Hulk's? Uh, no. Um, no, I'm not ambidextrous. Well, you know, sometimes you have to be. As a lefty, you are forced to be. Um, yes. So I can't saw very well with my right arm. And, and I don't know, it's, it's, it's not Hulk size, but um, it, it's, you have to learn to switch around. Um, yeah. You know, fortunately, I have left-handed molding planes now, um, but all my vintage molding planes are right-handed, and I have a left-handed sticking board, too, which is really kind of a pain in the butt when you have to switch. Um, but, you know, um, I have a right-handed rabbit plane. I have a right-handed plow plane. Um, it's, you just learn to switch back and forth. When I go to the museum, there are no left-handed mm. tools there, so you just got to deal with it. There even is the an element. Even the chisels are right-handed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you have a left-handed hammer, though, right? Yes, of course. To go with the right-handed uh, chisels. It was built by Ned Flanders. Um, the, uh, the one thing I'll say, though, that's really been beneficial is I've really gotten into carving a lot lately. I've been messing with it for like four years and just never really took it seriously. And um, one of the things that the, the, the pros will tell you is you need to, be, you need to get over left-hand, right-hand dominance because you're <laughs> constantly switching back and yeah. forth. And um, I, I found that my... my um, being forced to live in a right-handed world has been really good for me there. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm much more, uh, much quicker at moving back and forth between right hand and left hand. Of course, yeah. my carvings look terrible, so maybe, maybe I'm not that good at it. Now that I think about yeah. it. The, Can the Canadian rep for Lee Nielsen, Jeremy Tomlinson, one thing he he tells people is that there's no such thing as a left-handed or right-handed woodworker. Only someone who only knows how to work with their left or right-handed. And he really very, believes that it is essential to work with both hands. I could see that. That sounds very Confucius of him, but yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. And, you know, <laughs> here's the funny part is, is I, so much of the woodworking I do is in front of a camera, and you have mm -hmm. to learn to deal with it because sometimes you can't get that shot <laughs> doing it left-handed. And ah, you've got to switch uh -huh. to the right hand in order or, you know, I could move the camera on the other side, but then the lighting's wrong. So, yeah, I've, yeah. I've forced myself to do some of that. Yeah, I taught myself to cut dovetails with my left hand once, and then I was trying to teach myself to cut pins on both sides with both hands at the same time, and that didn't go so well. Yeah, no, I had a conducting professor that uh, yeah. told us that we had to be able to conduct three four time in one hand and four four on the other hand. <laughs> extremely difficult to do, but it was on the final, so I got it for like five wow. minutes and then never tried it again. Is that like rubbing your tummy and patting your head? I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we had a question, uh, question from Beth. Um, she was wondering if the Hento School has taken off enough, taken off enough yet, where you can consider uh, just doing that full time and not having a day job. No, no, it hasn't. It's taken off, no question. But um, you know, there's a couple of things at, at play. First of all, why would I quit my day job? I work for a lumber company. Hello. <laughs> no, that's not happening anytime exactly. soon. Um, and I mean, I'm the I'm the director of marketing. I still really love internet marketing, and and the the data geek in me loves that side of things. So it's a different kind of part of my personality that really feeds me. But you know, just fiscally, um, it costs a lot. It's, it costs a lot more than you would think to run something like this. Um, the school is is so much bigger than I ever thought it would be. Um, not quite two years into it. Um, which is just awesome. And frankly, I'm, I'm, I have a bunch of different kind of marketing ideas, obviously, since that's my day job, that would probably yield some pretty big payoff as far as new people enrolling, but I'm hesitant to do it because if the enrollment gets so high that I actually could quit my day job, I could actually make a living off of it, um, that's a lot of people who really are 
counting on me to, to produce a lot of stuff. And it's not that I'm afraid of doing that. I mean, the, the schedule that I've set over the last 18 months has been pretty nasty. But, um, you know, there's something about it still being a side business that it, it's nice. It gives me a little bit of a release valve. But I'm sure the day will come when I'm going to have to figure out what to do there. The other factor at play, honestly, is um, I made a lot of money in previous jobs. <laughs> I have, I have a certain kind of standard of living that I've gotten used to, and I have some bills and things that, you know, if I get all those bills taken care of and stuff like that, I might be able to consider it. But um, it, the enrollment would have to be really, really high. Um, as it is, when I left the IT world, I took a massive cut in pay, um, and it's been a lot of kind of adjusting and tightening the belt to get used to that. And I think we're used to it now, but. Um, it would be another pretty massive change to our lifestyle to do it again. Um, I know that probably sounds very selfish of me and greedy, but it is what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I'm with you. I, um, I have had things that I was really interested in that I turned into jobs, and, and making them a job ruined them. Yeah, it'll do that. I'm very fortunate right. that I still really, really love what I do with the hand tool school. I mean, I enjoy making <laughs> videos. I mean, I was the kid in, in elementary school and that always did a video for his presentation. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, it's always been something I've enjoyed doing. So the, the hand tool school combines a lot of things that I really like to do. So fortunately, that hasn't gotten to the point where I consider it a job in the bad yeah. sense of the word. So um, It's awesome. Yeah. So a couple more questions from Beth about the hand tool school. Uh, she said she signed up for a semester a year ago but she's been too busy to jump in consistently. Is it is it too late for her? I you know I don't actually know that I understand that question because there is no time on the Angel School. The way it's designed is move at your own pace. Um, when yeah. you join, when you enroll in a semester, that content is yours for life. Um, you a can download it. B you will always always have access to that. Um, to that part of the website. You'll always have access to the online tool library. You'll always have access to the archive, all the recordings of the live sessions. So there is no time limit. Um, and, and, you know, the idea is that I'm kind of always here to answer questions. If you have a question, I'll address it on camera in a live session or in a Skype call or over the phone or just via email. So, you know, the answer is no. It's never too late. I have people, you know, at least three or four times a week, someone signs up for semester one. You know, and here I am, finished semester three. Um, but I, I'm still fielding those questions. I'm still addressing those questions. So no, there's absolutely no time limit at all. In your shop, your pace, however long you want to take to take to do it. I think, I'd like to think that's the beauty of the whole thing, is there is no yeah. time on it. So, um, so you're essentially buying a lifetime license for the content of the semesters that you joined for? Yes. Yeah. That's great. There's a lot of people who think that's a bad business decision, but, you know, oh well. <laughs> volume, volume, volume. You know, I don't plan. Yeah. I, have, I have through semester nine already planned. Um, so great. I'm not going anywhere. By the time wow. I get done with semester nine, I'm sure all I have up through 18 planned. I've got, there's just so much stuff to do, you know. Wow. I mean, gradually it will, it will become... You know, right now, it's a, it's a, here's a lesson, here's kind of a project that goes with that lesson to apply that technique, or here's a larger project, but every time we tackle something new, I'll break off and do a lesson. Eventually, you're going to run out of lessons, you know? Eventually, it's something that's so specific that it's not worth breaking into its own lesson, so eventually, it probably will turn into a, you know, a guild build type thing, like what Mark has going on. But, um, you know, obviously the spin is we build it entirely by hand. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The difficulty for me has been letting go of my own, my own tastes. You know, I'm a period guy. I love Queen Anne furniture. Yeah. But the majority of my members do not. The majority of my members are Shaker fans and Arts and Crafts fans. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I went down that road with a corner cabinet I just finished, and I went kind of colonial on us there. But, um, you know, if it were up to me, we'd be building, you know, low boys and... and you know, 18th century furniture, but uh, yeah. we'll get there. We will get there. There are a few people in the school that are really into that, but, you know, the majority wants, and, and frankly, it's intimidating. And, and, you know, I think my skill level needs to improve a little bit before we can really jump into that, um, you know, and, and it, have it be useful. 
you know, you could watch me fumble about on camera learning something, and that's not really, it'll be useful to some extent, but not, you know, not as much mm -hmm. as it should be, I think. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going anywhere. 7 o'clock, Shannon. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Of course. Of course. Um, the, the Olympics are being DVR'd, so I'm good. Cool. <laughs> so, um, Beth is wondering if you're, if you're going to uh, reshoot some of your earlier lessons Oh my uh, God! Your yes, your presentation improved. <laughs> Holy cow! Yes, I am. Yeah, no. Okay, good. Not not only not only presentation, and and for those of you that have clicked through and watched the free preview of lesson one, I'm sorry. I mean, man, my problem there was um, I scripted it too much. It was like Wood Talk Online episode one. Yeah. I mean, it's it's awful. I mean, it makes me cringe to watch it. Um, I, and now I, back to Monica in the studio. Yeah, right. I am I am a performance major. I have a degree in voice performance, and I'm I've been on stage most of my life. I have no problem sitting in front of a camera. I have no idea what happened there. You know, it was like it was like I got stage fright or something. It was just terrible, and I was trying too hard to stick to a certain plan, and it just it didn't work. Additionally. I think a few of my views and opinions have changed a bit. There's a point yeah. in that first lesson where I talk about, you know what, just go out and buy premium tools. Um, <laughs> and I don't agree with that anymore. There is a point, there, there's, there's a point I was trying to make there that, you know, I want you to start working wood and not obsess over restoring and how does this tool and how does this tool work and what tool do I need next. Um, which, and, and the path of least resistance is to go and buy a Lee Nielsen or, or a Veritas plane because even though it says you should hone it, you can get to work without. Yeah. You, know, you yes. can put it out of the box, put a blade in, and be making beautiful shavings. And mm. I think you gain a better understanding of what tools you need after you've flattened and thicknessed a board by hand. And then you get a better understanding of what is sharp and what is not. Yes. So there is a point to be made by saying go and buy premium tools that you don't have to... You don't have to worry about all that other stuff to get working wood, but it also flies in the face of you know thousands of years of tradition too. That sharpening is a gateway skill, you know, and being able yeah. to restore a plane, set up a plane, get it working, there is some merit to that. Plus, it's expensive, man. It's yeah. really expensive, and you know I own a lot of expensive tools. I love to support boutique tool makers. Um, I will buy tools from them even if I don't need them, just because I want to see them do well. Um, <laughs> and I have a tool problem, but that's a different story. But, you know, there are some real, there are some, that's just the first thing that comes to mind, but there's some things that I say in the first couple of lessons that I think some of what I would change and not necessarily go 180 degrees the other direction, but I would, I would explain it a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it, that's going to be a long project, Beth, <laughs> for yeah. me to be able to redo a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's going to happen, certainly. It needs yeah. to. What about releasing some of those lessons on DVD? I've had that question a bunch. And, um, you know, the, the production side of that is, is kind, of a, it's kind of a rabbit hole. You can quickly get sucked down that and go another direction. Um, plus, personally... I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, I'm slowly but surely eliminating like physical media from my life and just moving to hard drives. Um, you know, there's something to that, but for now, um, I don't feel that it's fair to my current members to release a lesson or a project when they've paid for the whole thing. You know, they paid for the entire semester, and for me to break out part of it. To me, I, I could be wrong, but to me it kind of lessens what they've paid for a little bit. Um, so if I do, it will be a few more semesters down the road when my current members, and especially my founding members that took that leap on the first day, October 16, 2012. Um, and no, I mean, no, no, not 2012. 2010, sorry. Wow. Yeah, it's been two years almost. But yeah, there were something like 120 people that signed up in the first two hours. The school oh, went wow. and and that's just awesome, you know. And they're all still members, you know. I mean, it, that's just incredible to me. So it feels like a bit of a disservice to to release kind of piecemeal stuff for now. Um, I think eventually that will happen. And you know, the marketer in me says that's a way to capitalize on 
additional sales. <laughs> um, but you know, for honestly, for now, the hand tool school is self-sufficient. Um, it won't pay my mortgage um, and all the other bills right now, but it, it doesn't cost me anything to run it these days. So um, that's nice. <laughs> that means that I can continue to do what I'm doing and, and do it just for the sake of doing it and not for the sake of I need to make more money to pay my mortgage. Chris, I think you saw a couple questions. Yep. Um, where are we here? Uh, Jeff Morton just asked, uh, how are the iTunes po podcast working out for you, Shannon? I'm not sure what he means by that. How are they working out? Uh, they are. You're you're still producing them, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. On a regular, um, on a regular basis, and yeah, I've got one coming out on Friday actually. Um, um, I'm trying to shoot for one every two weeks these days. Um, okay. Sometimes it's not exactly two weeks. Sometimes it's in that second week that it comes out. Um, but that's another thing that I plan to do over the next seven weeks I have before semester four starts is I plan to record a lot of podcasts, um, you know, just raw footage that I can edit over time. But, you know, for instance, the spring pole lathe uh, is going to be at least two episodes. It might be three. And then there will probably be a series of episodes after that on actually turning with the spring pole lathe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've got, a, I've got a list a mile long of things that I want to cover. Um, topics. There's no end to the topics that I could cover. So that's not certainly not going anywhere. As far as how iTunes is working out, well, that could be a different story. Okay. <laughs> Rumor is that Apple is dumping podcasts very soon. So wow. you know, we may be moving wow. away from RSS feed podcasts and down to you know it's on my website or it's on YouTube. Mm. Mm. Um, Jeff clarified his question. He wants to know how popular the podcasts oh. have been. Mm. I would say very popular. Very um, popular. That's good. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> I could bore you with all kinds of data on that, but uh, Renaissance Woodworker is um, oh, last last week uh, had something about eighty-five thousand hits last week alone. Wow! Um, <clears throat> so just based on uh, those are unique visits. You know, page views is just off the charts. Downloads mirror that pretty closely. I mean, people come to watch the videos. Um, so yeah, they're very popular, um, and it's it that's that's flattering, but it's also very cool because it is something that I want to yeah. really keep doing. Yeah. I'm curious, Shannon, if you've found any change in traffic uh, since the summer started. Traffic always drops off when the summer starts. Yeah, it's okay. always lower um, from about June to end of August. Uh, people are on vacation. People are out. You know, kids are out of school. People just don't get that much shop time during the summer. I think um, if your shop isn't climate controlled, you're it's too hot to go out there. Um, yeah. It's just you know, with the kids home from school, there's just there's too many other things to get in the way. So yeah, that's pretty typical. Okay. We had a question from Dave Barden, and who wants to know who inspires you? Oh wow. Um, <laughs> you mean today? Uh, well, I mean, in the woodworking, in the woodworking realm, right? Well, I mean, the obvious thing is Roy Underhill. Um, not so much as a woodworker, but as a as a showman. Um, what that man does just blows me away. Um, his his <laughs> desire to share um, old woodworking techniques and, and vintage methods is just unbelievable. I mean, you don't do what he's been doing for thirty plus years. Um, because I guarantee you PBS is not paying him a whole bunch of money. Um, you just don't do that unless you really love doing it. And now that the vintage episodes are starting to come out on DVD and on, online with Popular Woodworking, there is so much information locked in there. I mean, he's inspiring a whole new generation and doing it in one take, you know, while bleeding. I mean, as someone who spends a lot of time in front of a camera, that's just amazing to me. The amount of preparation that must go into that, the number of setup pieces, and the number of times he builds a project in order to be able to show it live in 30 minutes is just insane. Um, mm -hmm. Plus, just his style. Um, I, I am not a... How shall I put this? Um, I'm not a guy who cares that the inside of my cabinet is ultra smooth. I love, I love the fact that it has scrub plane marks or four plane marks on the inside. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a guy that's going to get really upset if there's a little gap in my dovetails. Um, and that's kind of like Roy as well. Now, he's 
capable of making much more beautiful stuff than he does on the show because he's on the clock. But, you know, there's something about that everyman furniture that Roy makes that I really like. So he's definitely a big one. Um, Charles Brock, love the guy. Um, what he's doing in taking a very maloof, you know, iconic piece and making it his own. Some of the stuff that he's coming out with with his sculpture furniture designs is just really cool. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he's a teacher. He was a teacher for 30 years in middle school, I want to say. So here's a guy that's just sharing everything he knows, and that's just really, really cool. So I could probably think of 20 others, but <laughs> we probably don't have that much time. Cool. Well, why don't we wrap it up? We're past time, unless, Chris, do you have any more questions? Uh, that's all I see there, Matt. Okay, cool. Shannon, I just want to say thanks uh, for joining us today. You're the last of the Wood Talk guys. Yay. Um, <laughs> that we, we kind of saved you for last because there's a, a lot of hand tool talk in wood chat, and um, I know a lot of us are getting into the hand tools, and um, I've been doing it a lot lately. I've been watching a lot of the Bob Rosieski's podcasts, which I think are wonderful and outstanding. Yeah. I mean that guy, and and you know he, I, I when you when you said you know the the mill marks on the inside of the cabinet, I was I was just you know to me Bob Rosieski popped into my head. So yeah, um, he, he inspires me too. Of, uh, <laughs> he had the unfortunate duty of of helping me at the um, kind of being the the guy from Society of American Period Furniture Makers at the uh, Hanto Olympics uh, yeah. when I was doing my dovetails. And uh, so anyway, we, I just wanted to say thanks. It's been great having you here, and I, I know yeah, that chat really, Wood Chat really uh, appreciate it. Well, and honestly, Wood Chat is something I usually try to make it to, but I often lurk a lot of times because I'm usually working. Oh. I'm usually in the <laughs> shop working while it's going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I like the direction this is taken, too. The, uh, the Hangout is kind of a cool addition. Yeah. It's nice. And, you know, if you're in the shop working, uh, go ahead and go to Google+, and we'll, we'll, put your, we'll put video up of you working. And, you know, when we see you make mistakes, we'll make sure we talk about them. And, uh, nice. Well, yeah, and that's one, one last question. How's your dog? How oh, he's Alex? good. He's awesome. Didn't, didn't yeah, he, he, did he, was he the one that recently had a trip to the vet, or was that Mark's dog? Uh, I think it was Mark's dog, but he he had a trip to the vet that caused me to miss woodworking in America one year. Um, yeah. What was that? Two thousand nine, I think. Yeah. But no, he's fine. He's fine. He's been locked out of the room because he paces when I'm on the computer. <laughs> my uh, my daughter, my five year old, was watching one of your podcasts with me, and it was the one where you cracked up laughing because he got up and hit his head. <laughs> oh God, that was awesome. And she just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. So she, she tries to get our our beagle to come out and just dodge into the shop, but he won't do it. I think one of these days I need to release an Alex blooper reel because there's would a lot be, of them. I would pay for that. There's a, there's a lot of them. But most of them are only like two seconds long, so yeah. I have to slow them down and things. But, yeah, he's done some real bonehead things in the shop. Um, <laughs> it's probably so one, of the, one of the driving factors that took me to hand tools too because he like, used to like to lay down behind me when I was at the table saw. And that was just not good. <laughs> cool. When uh, well, when you get that spring pole lathe going, we'd be interested in the tour. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Right on. Absolutely. Yeah. You guys have to promise not to um, criticize my choice of wood, though. <laughs> I'm going to catch some Where flack. Where is he going with this? I'm going to catch some flack. It's made out of figured tapili. Okay. It's, I, I was it's not going to be the, the uh, clown pants spring pole lathe with... Purple yeah. heart and zebra wood and <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's something that's traditionally made out of like big box store lumber and trash lumber. Well, this was destined for the trash. <laughs> it just happens to be figured to peely. Yeah. So yeah, it's a uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a Lamborghini of spring pole lathes when it's done. Yeah. Cool. Well, good save. Right. I think that wraps it up, Chris. Any final words? See ya in Pasadena. Right on. Right on. Looking forward to that. All right. Well, thanks, guys. All right, buddy. Signing off. See you, Woodchatters. Bye, everybody. Good night. <laughs>